So for the people who were here yesterday, I was talking about trusting technology, which kind of links nicely to what Noah was saying. And I talked more about how, how do we look at that, how is trust built, how is it broken. As we've heard, the algorithms, a lot of us don't know how they work until we start to look into it. I was one of those people. So one of my key areas, we started on a Fin Trust program um, about four years ago, which was looking at how these algorithms actually exclude people from financial services to get access to financial services, which led to the term for inclusion. So we got some money from Alan Turing Institute and the Gates Foundation, actually, to look at could we do a proof of concept around it. But behind it, this is a very busy graphic, but I'm sure we can share it later. But if you look at the red on this side, it is UK focus and the green. What you can see is the included in the green and the excluded in the red. So if you just focus on those two signposts at the top, so 27.6 million highly able to include, 9 million can't use it. Okay, and this is 2020, so this is now out of date and it's probably got worse. And if you can see the top map around the UK, in the northeast where I come from, 52% of people are excluded. And that's a social economic issue as well. And if you want to look at this graph later or look up the Good Things Foundation, they do lots of statistics around this. Um, but what I thought is, how can I sit here in a relatively privileged position with this data, with the ability that I've gone through the education system and not do something about this? Knowing that the algorithms are also being trained on this data to include the included, but what is it doing for the excluded? And this covers ethnicity, diversity, et cetera, et cetera, because, as I said yesterday, what the algorithm is trained upon and to predict is what we know. It, it's our data sets and what they're fed by the engineers, they're taught in our, in our universities. This is how you do compute science. But they're not asked to question too much about what you're putting in there and is it going to cause what you probably heard, unintended consequences of using technology. So if you look at this, the FCA in the UK came up with these four drivers of things that could throw you into a vulnerable position. They call them vulnerable customers, but I don't like that because I think that then labels somebody as a vulnerable customer when really you're in a vulnerable situation because the level of technology, etc. that we've heard is predicting what you will do and where you will become because we're now going into automation. So let me ask you, looking at that, in 2021, how much percentage of, sorry, UK population do you think fell into these categories? Any guesses as a percentage? Louder? Not quite as high as that. 53%. Now, that was before impact of Brexit has fully got in. As you, we all know, the UK is in a mess economically at the moment. Um, interest rates have gone up. Food prices, the hashtag eat or heat is, is flying around the UK at the moment. So 53% in 2000 last year were in this bracket. Even people who have good jobs, holding down, you know, reasonable income, etc., are struggling. So it's like, what do we can do about this using the technology? And is it right? Is it social justice? You know, digital technology should be used as a social justice tool. And what I did, I worked with, um, I thought, what is it like to be the other? Because I don't know exactly what it's like to be on the periphery of systems. I don't know what it's like to struggle if a computer says no to me. And I thought, ID must be an issue because it's easy for me. I can just tap. I know that I've got acceptance. I know that I've got good credit rating. I can prove my ID pretty quickly. So what I did, I spoke to um, someone called the Asta Foundation in the UK, which has 100,000 clients who are from all walks of life. They're either being rehabilitated into the systems of life for various reasons, homelessness, falling on hard times, rehabbing from prison, etc. And I said, what's, what's your greatest problem in trying to go online and, and trusting the online system? And although you say, oh, well, 79% are okay, but 21% is quite a lot out of 100,000 people. And that's just one, one institution who are dealing with people across the UK. You times that, and then we've got a serious problem. And it's this KYC, so know your customer. This was brought in by the FCA, who came up with a chart before, because of the crash in 2008. We need to know who we're lending money to to make it responsible. Okay, that's a good, really good thing to do, responsible lending. However, we are training the ID on, guess what, hereditary, 
by its data that hasn't always been checked to say if it's good. And then it gets fit into the algorithms like Noah showed. So when you do searches like, you know, what is my credit score? Oh, well, because you've this, this, and this, you're not going to get there. And it's not, the credit scoring system is old, okay? It's working on the model. It's not reflecting the diversity in our current society, etc. And I think I mentioned that yesterday. So flying through this quickly. So what do we do with the money? We had a look at, could we use blockchain, and Josh is going to talk about blockchain, and could we come up with a digital solution and use something else to identify, and we called the credential fairness for all, because we were trying to be fair and transparent, and I know it's someone put up transparency of the algorithms. If you want to talk to me about that later, it's really problematic. We can't do it in full yet, and there's reasons why. But what we did do was use uh, Microsoft's ION technology to do this. Now, there's limitations. What I'd like to do is, anybody heard the term self-sovereign identity? Anyone? No. So that's basically, oh, sorry. Yeah, you have. <laughs> so to define it quickly, what it means, if you think, it was like us taking back control of our data. So rather than GAFA, the big tech companies, getting our data, harvesting it, and selling it to third parties with you, when you click GDPR, yes, oh, I want to see the content, yes. That goes off and they can sell it to third parties okay, and make lots of money. Self-sovereign ID is taking it back to us. We own the data and then giving it out to people. Sounds simple, not simple to do online or to secure that digital identity. As you can imagine, there's cloning, there's all sorts of things that, that technologists have got to work around. So we tried to go through it, and what we did was we said to the issuer in the UK, we could use this national health service because no matter who you are, when you come into the country, you will get issued with a national health service number. If you don't have a driving license, um, a passport, or a utility bill to say you live on an address and you're paying for electricity, but your national health service number comes with you everywhere. So they could be the issuer of the credential to say, this is Karen. She lives there. She is that person. And then the verifier would be, in this case, we were looking at like a financial institution, a fintech or a bank, etc. And then you're the subject holder. So using this wallet that we created there, you go through the sequence of how we saw for child verification. You'd log in to say it was you. The issuer would go, yes, it's Karen. Go back to the verifier. So again, it's premised on trust. But there's a big problem with this. If we click back to the 9 million who can't use the internet, how can they use that? They can't, right? So there's this problem, I call it like stage one, stage two of financial inclusion. If you're in stage one, you still can't get hold of the internet, right? You still can't get your hands on it. Um, you've got to go through an IP provider, the big tech companies, but they need payment for that. And like we said, it's like eat or heat at the moment, not eat, heat and use Instagram or transact. And therefore, you know, who's doing anything about this? So I've been working with the Data Poverty Alliance to look at how can we get big companies. And one of my missions, which I'm starting to get people to garner around, is if we could get the big banks and fintechs who make a lot of money, even if we could get them to sideline 0.2% of their profits every year into a social pot to actually address inclusion, then we could pay for people to have connections. We could pay to people to get digital skills and financial literacy skills. There's lots of new companies starting up around financial literacy, to gamification, making it a game for all ages. So it's aggregated up, whether you're young or you're an adult. You can play a game to learn how financial services work for you. And I mentioned yesterday, there's consumer duty came in with the FCA, where they have to make everything that they distribute to you understandable. Has anybody ever signed a financial agreement? And like all the terms and conditions? underneath, and you read to me like, I'm not sure what that means. Well, now they have to really explain what they are selling you, why you pay so much back on your credit cards or whatever, and who benefits from that. So we're going in the right direction, but again, we need to trust that they're doing the right thing. And again, we've got this side of like, we want regulators like the FCA to come in and make sure that the innovation is trustworthy, doing the right thing. But at the same time, you've got young fintechs wanting to get into the market and go, we can use data and technology in a really great way. There are lots of examples in South Africa and India where they've been using SIM cards to actually help people transact and have basic transit. It's not perfect, but I would like to see a little bit more of that come into the UK and other countries to say, can we at least get people a basic bank account? Because if you can't transact, 
then you can't access other spheres of life, and then you are also open to harms because you're paying a poverty premium. So what do I mean by that? Because the algorithm then says, mm, you're not earning so much, you're, um, the algorithm has been taught that you are there for the risk factor, so like the waiting, you'll be added a risk waiting, the potential of not being able to pay back on a loan or a credit card. And therefore, like in the UK at the moment, which is ridiculous, that somebody who is earning maybe less than half of what I earn is actually paying more for electricity and heating because their credit scoring is, by an algorithmic decision and weight, saying they're less likely to pay than me, which is a fallacy because it's not always true that everybody on a low income is really bad with money management. They're just not. It's a generalization, but this is how we've seen with predictions. A algorithm will gather all this data and harvest it and go, what do we predict this person not pay? Um, there's a little bit more fine grain than that, as we know, but that's the result. So we've got to try and balance between regulation and innovation, because like some of your points, for me, it's for the citizens. It's about an equitable digital society. What does that mean? Equality, so that we can have this equal playing field. Is that a bit of a myth? Mm, maybe. You know, we have to deal with the powers that be and the tech giants, etc. But if we, if we join the dots and get lots of people making a noise about this, then we've got more chance of like pushing that power barrier the other way and go, we're not going to accept that. We're actually going to actually stand up and make you think that, yes, it needs to be responsible innovation, but it, we also need regulate to protect us as citizens. So the algorithms aren't allowed to do this. We have to hold the people to account. We have to educate our computer scientists to go, think about the data that you're doing. Think about when you're asking, you don't need to be a philosopher, but you need to think about the risks of doing this here and who you're going to exclude further down the line. You know, we're living in a very diverse society. Is a diverse thinking up front in the algorithms? I would say not. So this is what we need. You know, we're an asserted trusted identity. There's lots of people all over the world working on this, and Josh will talk about this, and going towards self-sovereign ID. But there is problems with that, as I said, because how do you make safe your own ID, holding it on a wallet and sharing it with other people? And again, we need to make it inclusive so that everybody can go on that same journey. So this is where we've got to have rights, we've got to assert our rights, we've got to enforce accountability because they say nobody's holding the big tech to account and now the big tech and the big finance groups are going, hmm, all this technology that these are, you know, people of your age are starting up fintechs, really agile, small companies coming with great days to use the technology that we don't know. You know, you know better than us how to use new technology. So the older guys in the, in the banks are going, oh, we'll just have that, we'll just pay you lots of cash, you've started up, let's just buy you off, take that technology and we have the knowledge and then we'll decide what to do with it. And you can almost see this as simulation. I went to the Open Banking World Conference four years ago and I went cold because the first day was all the big incumbents presenting. Big incumbent banks, you know, the big giants, what are you going to do in the next five years? Oh, well, we'll still be here. The next day it was Ant, Google, Apple, all coming in, I was like, oh my God, it's like the changing of the monopolies. You know, one monopoly is being replaced by another. Where's our voice in this? Where, where's the rights for the people? So I think that we need to think about these as well, linked to what Noel was saying. We need to ask. You can't just make these things happen because bad stuff. Why does bad stuff happen? Because humans have a dark side to our psychology. We've got the, what if I just do this, from a kid, right? Like we said yesterday, when you're a child and you've got younger, you go, don't touch that because it'll burn your hand, and they go, ah. And we still do it as adults, you know, like we get things and go, oh, if we just do this. But if you think with an algorithm, that can have huge effects. We know about hackers, we know about the wars, potentially, you know, Russia, supposedly, allegedly, whether it's fake news or not, is, is attacking the UK and other countries using these very algorithms, etc. So we need to think about how we do it holistically. It is a complex adaptive system, and there's no one person has a handle on this, and we need to work together to make it go through it. So I mentioned yesterday, corporate digital responsibility. Is it the panacea? No. But it's one way to get to people thinking about how we do this with purpose and trust, which sounds coy at the middle of its essential goal, but if we enough of us start to think about how we push this forward, how we get diversity of thought, how we change that dynamic that it's not just people who are white from a privileged education background that get to put the input into what should go into the algorithm so we don't see things like Noah 
came up with, which we know are erroneous and hurtful. So it's called dark tracing as well, if you want to Google it. <laughs> you can look up, there is dark tracing about how this, this subliminal push, dark nudges, the darker side of our psyche to go, oh, what if, you know, can I do this? Is this something? And we all have that propensity in us to do it. It's just most of us had a moral, ethical compass that will stop us from going, no, that really has a bad consequence. But there are those who will go, I can make money from doing this. And that overrides the purpose motive. So, you know, the dark side of our psychology is now feeding into the dark side of tracing, etc. So, again, I don't want to finish on a bad note. I think there's optimism out there. I think that a lot of people, most people who work in technology and finance, want to do better things. They don't set out to do bad things. But what they don't do is ask enough questions of the technology, how they're using it, where it came from, who had the input into designing it in the first place, and what, what purpose is it going to be. So this is where we're looking, starting to look in the project agency on complex online harms. So again, we heard some from Rachel about you know, promoting people, doing self-harm, etc. But beyond that, scammers, etc., what happens when you get older, you get dementia or cognitive impairment, you can be taken advantage of because what looks real is built up to look like your bank, might not be. 